Welcome to the HR Chat Podcast, bringing the best of the HR, talent, and leadership communities to you. For more episodes and the latest articles covering what's new in the world of work, visit hrgazette.com, subscribe and follow us on social media. Welcome to another episode of the HR Chat Show. I'm your host today, Bill Bannum. The William G. McGowan Charitable Fund, a family foundation dedicated to furthering the compassionate philanthropy and the ethical leadership of William G. McGowan in partnership with the Society for Human Resource Management, recently announced the first ever Ethical Leader of the Year Award to be presented by the fund at the opening session of SHRM's annual conference and expo in beautiful New Orleans on June 12th. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined today by McGowan Fund Executive Director, Diana Spencer, and Johnny C. Taylor Jr., President and CEO of SHRM, to tell us more. Diana, Johnny, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the HR Chat Show today. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. Um, no, mine too. Mine too. Johnny and I are both have both been looking forward to this, and we're just delighted to be with you today. Beyond my reintroduction there, why don't you both take a minute or so to introduce yourselves? Diana, would you like to go first? Well, sure. Thank you. So, Bill, I'm Diana Spencer, Executive Director of the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. We're based in Chicago and a place-based philanthropy doing grant making across five regions in the United States and also have the McGowan Fellows Program that brings us together today. So we've been working on this initiative for the past year and are just really looking forward to an upcoming event that's going to be a lot of fun. So it's a pleasure to be with you. Wonderful. And Johnny, I'm sure all of our listeners already know who you are, but why don't you introduce yourself to? Well, I am very, very honored to be joining you all, Bill. I love HR, the HR Gazette. So really honored to have the opportunity to be interviewed by you and with my colleague, Diana. Very, very excited. I'm the CEO of SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, and just really honored to to have the opportunity to talk about a very, very important and timely topic. Okay. Well, with that said, then let's get into it, guys. Uh, Diana, starting, starting with you, 12 years ago, the McGowan Funds Board made a new commitment to ethical leadership by launching the McGowan Fellows Program, dedicated to including its principles of ethical leadership in MBA and other leadership programs in concert with 10 of the nation's leading universities. Can you tell me now how the success of of that program in the eyes of the students and the participating institutions and the focus on ethical leadership has led to the McGowan Fund to create the Ethical Leader of the Year Award? Yeah, Bill, that is such a great question. I want to start with just a little bit of history and context for the program and what's brought us here today. So, you know, the the benefactor of the McGowan Fund was the CEO and founder of MCI Communications, and he was known to be a very ethical leader. He had one saying that every person who knew him knew of, and that was, there's one way to do things, and that's the right way. So during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, when people were losing homes and, and literally becoming homeless, people who had never had this experience before, there were there were places... Um, that launched called Tent Cities, where people who had no family around were were taking up living quarters for the time. And, you know, we were developing the McGowan Fellows Program at that time, and it was just, you know, because our work is also steeped in poverty elimination. And so it became so critically important to the board that this program that would support 10 aspiring leaders, our McGowan Fellows, each year from these 10 wonderful premier schools in the U.S., um, it became critically important that we have this steeped in ethical leadership to really bring in people that we thought were going to be well poised to be leaders and then put them through programming through a variety of experientials that would really instill the principles of ethical leadership as defined, you know, by the McGowan Fund, I don't think there's anything unusual that anyone would say, you know, that a leader needs to have. So it's um, accountability, it's character and integrity, it's courage, it's empathy, it's resilience and self-awareness. So through this experiential, you know, we put our McGowan fellows through this, this wonderful experience 
um, for nine months of the year in their second year of MBA candidacy. So what brings us to this point today of launching this Ethical Leader of the Year Award is, you know, multifaceted. So first of all, there is a need today to, to uplift ethics in our national narrative. There's, it's been such a time of crisis in the past two years, not to mention all of the, the media coverage for unethical practices, and we really want to change this narrative. We really want MBA programs to instill these principles and experiential training that we know has a deep impact on the students. We really want the MBA programs to change their curriculum to instill principles and experiences into the MBA experiences for students. So the students come to us and they're great people already. They're poised for leadership, but they come in and they haven't really had the opportunity to explore values-based leadership in a deep way. There may be a class, there may be a seminar, but nothing that is a deep experiential. So as we do as our evaluations through interviews, through surveys, through their reflective writing, what we have learned from them is that this is a transformational experience. They come in thinking that they, of course, are well-versed in all of the principles, but as they go through their social impact project and their coaching with fellows alumni, there is a change for them. There is a realization that there is so much more to values-based decision-making, that there is such thought required when making decisions for the betterment not only of their company or themselves, but for society overall. Our schools, we think, find great value in this program. They come together in a partner school convening every year and talk about ethics and how they're thinking about teaching it, incorporating it into their curriculum. And so there is this almost like a national movement that is building in this need and for, for ethical leadership. So as we come to this particular point, we decided that it was time that we change the narrative. You know, if, if you think about the business roundtable and comments that have come out of there, if you think about the, the media and all of the focus on unethical or really the results of unethical business practices, we realize that there's a lot going on from very ethical leaders that can help us promulgate and raise this conversation on the need for ethical leadership and frankly, how to instill it across corporations. Johnny, in your mind, what does it mean to be a value-driven leader? So increasingly, and, and frankly, over the last, oh, five to seven years, as we at Sherm have surveyed employees, what we've heard is that it's more than money. It's more than just winning. The ends don't justify the means. Increasingly, the millennial generation, uh, Generation Z, have said to us, like, this really matters how we achieve success. And, and so there's been a, just an, an amazing kind of groundswell of support for, for ethical leadership. And what we know is many, and, and why we are so pleased to partner uh, with the McGowan Fund is because we've talked about it a lot, but we've not done our part in preparing leaders in their MBA, their real formal training to factor in um, appropriate ethical leadership decision making and in, in the way they do business. So it's not like a program and this isn't about the police and it's not about, you know, it should be just built into the way organizations run themselves, a part of their culture. So the anything that we at Sherm can do to partner with anyone, include, and we're very excited that the one here's the McGowan Fund and my colleague Diana Spencer. But the fact that we can play a role in ensuring that the future leaders actually understand the significance of this and not just the word ethics. I mean, it's an easy word to roll off of your, your tongue. We have to actually identify 
the behaviors, the practices, and not necessarily focusing on the bad actors, but to highlight the good actors, the people who actually live and practice good ethical business every day. It's as Diana talked about it. It is true. I mean, you go back to what the Business Roundtable and all of the business magazines were saying as we've moved from just stakeholder focus and now to, I'm from shareholder to stakeholder focus, we realized that there are people who have real interest in business being uh, practicing ethically and with a broader lens of doing good than just the shareholder community. So very, very excited. And it ties into our work. We at Sherm have a mantra, which is better workplaces lead to a better world. And we know that it starts for so many Americans in particular, half, 165 million people go to work every day. So half of the U.S. population, to the extent we can begin to embed ethical behavior into the way they think, just the way they do business, not only will the workplace be the beneficiary, but more broadly, society Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Now then, Diana, you're quoted as saying, we believe that the very best leaders approach challenges with a well-defined ethical framework. They use this framework to make their decisions on how to meet the goals of their companies while being responsible and responsive to the needs of society, their customers and their employees. Diana, what advice would you offer to leaders looking to improve and project the ethical framework of their organizations? Well, that's, again, Bill, a really great question. And first, I want to preface this by saying there's never one solution or one way of being in the world. But I do think that organizations beginning with a a framework of defining their values. So what does it mean to have, in our case, character and integrity? What's the definition of that? How do we define that? And what does it look like when we're living by this? And what does it look like when we're not living by this? So, you know, we went through every one of the McGowan principles in defining them in talking about how it shows up and how it doesn't show up. So I think that, first of all, not only creating it for a website or for the public to see, but to really embrace this as, and and Johnny said it so well, you know, it becomes part of the culture, part of the DNA of an organization in whatever the the number of values-based decision-making principles they have, however they're going to enact that. I think that every person from the C-suite down to the lowest paid employee in the entire organization, I think that it just becomes part of the DNA of the organization. That's the first thing. And then how do you how do you operationalize this, right? So again, it's it's one thing to have a statement on a website, but then what does it mean? You've defined it. You've said, here's how it shows up. Here's how it doesn't show up. But when it comes to operationalizing it, there's, there's ways that, that you have to do this. So I think that every department within every organization is, is probably going to have someone leading this charge. I believe that key leaders of an organization should have a deeper level of experiential training in ethical leadership development. You know, learning is vertical. It never stops, but but you have to start somewhere and you keep building and building and building and expanding this thought, this vision of having an ethical company so that everyone in the company knows the CEO's values. They can cite them to you. They know what their leadership is about. They know what to expect in decisions. And that way, when tough decisions come up that could look like, oh gosh, why did someone make this decision? There still is trust that's been instilled, not only by the employees, but think about the communities that people work in. It is so important for for organizations, big corporations, to be respected, to see value. If there is distrust in a community, that is, that's never going to end well. People are never going to see you as a, as a valuable partner in the community. And frankly, I feel like corporations, big institutions, are leaders in their communities. They're looked at. There are societal problems in every community in this country. 
how does that corporation show up? Again, not only on paper or to say, here's what we do, but how do you get involved? How do you get people involved? So, you know, our program really takes our students out into this stretch experience where we're working on this this past year it's been on youth experiencing homelessness and we do a point in time count which counts everyone experiencing homelessness that's unsheltered living on the streets of chicago every year and let me tell you these students are uncomfortable this isn't anything they've experienced there's a little bit of fear and and please know that they're very safe we would never expose them to anything where they were not we are with the city and so, but giving people this opportunity to see how other people are living, when you're in the C-suite, I think it's really easy to become disengaged from what so much of society really experiences. So having this knowledge, this level of knowledge, creates that empathy for people. It creates this desire to be a good partner in the community. So I think that you know, as companies really start embracing this more and more, that it's first of all, embracing, truly embracing whatever the values are, define them, define how they show up, how they don't show up, and how you are going to operationalize this inside your company for every single person until every person in the organization knows what you stand for. Wonderful. Thank you, Diana. Johnny, after the nominations have been submitted, the final list of candidates will be determined by a committee of national leaders, including yourself. I'd love for you now to talk to our listeners about the boards, how it was selected, and what the board represents in terms of inspiring leaders. Yes. So as Diana shared, once they launched, and I have to give all credit to the McGowan Fund and Diana's leadership, they came to us with this idea and, the, and they said, we're going to, we want to search for key leaders who are interested in focusing on ethics and ethical leadership. And more importantly, these are people who themselves have to have evidenced a commitment to this. So again, it's easy to say it, but doing it in practice is, is really the challenge. So she wanted a cross-sector approach. And so I was recruited as an HR industry expert. After all, we think, given that we have 300,000 members across the globe, 165 countries, we have a pretty good idea about the insights of the employee population. What does the workforce really want? What, where do ethical show up? How do they rise or not to the level that they get the appropriate level of attention? So uh, they asked me to come on as sort of the voice of employers and employees. And then Marna Whittington, who is like amazingly, she's the voice of corporate boards. And she understands, after all, CEOs are hired by boards. And so she understands they're also fired by boards for potentially unethical, she understands and has a lot of experience in that vein. Leo Dino, energy, like, right? All of us, you can decide whether or not you want to buy products in a particular sector, but all of us need energy companies, right? <laughs> and we know that Leo is deeply committed to ethical leadership. And again, not just today, but he's done this over the course of his career. And then Dan Cardinelli, CEO of the independent sector, who is also has justly said he's going to focus on ethical leadership. When you take this cross section of leaders, myself included, we think we've covered the basis. By the way, um, many of us have also had corporate experience. So while I currently run a large trade association, there, uh, you know, I spent 25 years or so in corporate America, having seen different types of leaders operate their businesses, some in very, very ethical ways and some in not so desirable ways. So we use our collective set of experiences to bring a point of view to this discussion, hoping that we select people who are truly inspiring ethical leaders. Johnny, so the, the awards will be presented at the opening session of Sherm's annual conference and expo. I'm delighted that I'm going to be one of the 15,000 attending in person and virtually. <laughs> I'm going to be in New Orleans. Can't wait. I can't wait. Why is the Sherm conference the right place to showcase this award? So the Sherm annual conference is the largest convening 
of HR professionals on the globe ever. Every year we are that. And even in a post-pandemic uh, environment where we're going to have 15,000 people. We've had as many as 20,000 free pandemic. So go back to 2019, there were 20,000 plus people in the room. What better of a platform to take the concept of ethical leadership, again, more than the word ethical or the phrase ethical leadership, but to bring it to life in practice. HR leaders are on the front line every day within their organizations, oftentimes playing the role of the the, the, the the group that keeps the organization honest, right? So you can say you're committed to ethical leadership. And we, because of our interesting uh, position between employer and employee, we see it show up or not every day. So we thought, what better of a setting? We will have other CEOs there, uh, not just HR professionals, but CEOs, Bruce Broussard, CEO of Humana, one of the largest healthcare companies in the world, will be there. We said, why not use this as the opportunity to say Sherm is committed to more than just the words, but to the action, the behaviors of ethical leadership. So we have great in-depth research out of our research team, which can supplement this. So it's about using this opportunity to amplify the message so that these folks take it back into their organizations and it really, really get, you know, it, it can cascade into organizations. That's why we think it's so important to use this main stage opening day to showcase our commitment to, as a profession, ethical leadership. Okay, I'll, I'll be in the media pit somewhere in the audience <laughs> fighting off the others, trying trying to get to the uh, award winner for that first exclusive interview. There we go. Hey, Johnny, speaking of exclusives, Johnny, um, I, I, I couldn't help myself, but as I've got you on the show today, I, I thought I'd, I'd ask you what's coming up for Sherm over the next 12 months and any, any announcements that you can share here today with, with our audience. Well, if you're not coming to Sherm 22, you're going to miss a heck of a great party. When I tell you from CEOs, major companies to Ariana Huffington, we'll send and we will talk about a very important issue facing so many of us across the globe, mental health, the importance of bringing mental health uh, up to parity with physical health. She will be there. Brad Paisley for those. And let me tell you, the women are just so excited about Brad Paisley's perform. <laughs> and guess what? I'm a guy. I'm pretty darn excited too. I have to admit. Right. And uh, we're going to have, get ready. Here's the headliner. President George Bush will actually grace the stage and talk to us about leading through some very, very tumultuous times. As you might imagine, all of us know this was the leader during 9-11 when the entire world uh, froze. I mean, we've not had that sort of moment in a long time and hopefully won't see it anytime soon, but we want to hear from a leader who had to literally take a lot. We're going to bring this thread of ethical leadership through that. We want to hear him say, what are the things you think about when you respond, for example, to an attack by another country on your country? How do you do so? Do you do so? And what are the ethical implications of that decision? It's easy to just strike out, but you don't strike out at a country, you harm people who are in a country. So we have to think about those things. So very excited about that. We also, though, have inclusion 20. 22 over the next 12 months. Notice I didn't say diversity. Everyone's having a diversity and inclusion conference. Ours is very much focused on inclusion. Diversity is a coming. So we got that part. We are going to focus on how do we do everything that we can to ensure that as we bring a more and more diverse workforce to the workplace, that they are truly belong, they're heard, and then they're included. So those are going to be the big things. So June, New Orleans, and then San Diego in October, October 24th through the 26th, we're going to tackle this very vexing social, uh, uh, social issue of inclusion in the workforce. Well, there you have it, listeners. Be there or be a rectangle. I did chat with <laughs> with with, uh, Matt, with Mallory and, and the awesome team over uh, in, in in Sherm's PR department about maybe getting an in, interview with uh, said former President Bush. But uh, I guess he's a little bit too busy for the HR Chat podcast, which I guess is for, <laughs> fair enough, really. But you know, we'll, we'll keep we'll keep working on it. One day, one day. Hey, I'm sad to say that we are coming towards the end of this particular episode. Before we do wrap up. I'd, I'd love for you both to tell our listeners how they can connect with you. I've sent you both invitations on LinkedIn, by the way, um, and also how they can learn more about all the awesome things happening over at McGowan and at Sherm. 
Sure. So, gosh, Bill, again, thank you so much for this time to be on HR Gazette. It's such an exciting time in the world of ethics, and, and it's just such a wonderful um, opportunity that we have with Johnny and his gracious team to be part of the SHRM 22 conference, Cause the Effect. And so you can learn more about the Ethical Leader of the Year Award through the Cause the Effect SHRM 2022 conference links. You can find more about the McGowan Fund and our Ethical Leader of the Year, Year Award campaign and our initiatives with the McGowan Fellows Program at www.williamgmcgowanfund.org. And for my part, SHRM.org, best way to find everything that we have, not only information about our annual conference, which and I'm so excited about the Ethical Leader of the Year Award, but also just information about how we are thinking about work, workers, and the workplace. And there's data there and tools there for non-HR professionals as well. So we encourage everyone to go there. We are an important um, organization focused on ensuring that work works for all. Perfect. And there will be plenty more content between now and um, 2022 focused on the amazing conference and expo from, from this podcast and from the HR Gazette. So please do stay tuned listeners. But for now, I'm sad to say, because this has been an awesome conversation, but for now, it, that just leaves me to say, Diana and Johnny, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of the HR Chat Show. Thank you for having us. Thanks, my friend. And listeners, as always, until next time, happy working. Thanks for listening to this episode of the HR Chat Podcast. There are hundreds of conversations with business experts available for free on the HR Gazette website, Apple, Spotify, and all the main platforms. And remember to like, subscribe, and follow us on social media.